In the past, the ocean has been seen as one big area where everything can live everywhere, and we're finding out that it's not true. So if you exploit one area completely, you might not find those species again anywhere else. One of the things that we know for sure that deep sea does is carbon sequestration, which we need um, with the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere currently. And if you want to look at this in a very sort of practical way, you should care about diversity because the various metabolites, biological products that those organisms are producing may be important to us either as food or some kind of medicine, antibacterial compound. There's all kinds of diversity down there that we don't know about. We're visiting communities that are more than a two kilometers deep in some cases, and so I think a lot of people sort of assume that's out of sight, out of mind, out of danger, but in fact that's not the case. During the dives we saw definitely a gill net and a few other net types. One of the nets actually reminded me of an older method of fishing for the coral. Mining has a potential to destroy a lot of these corals because uh, the future of mining is looking at these hard substrates, uh, which is where the corals grow. We are a long way from any land that people live on. It took us nine days to get out here by ship. And yet we saw behaviors in the seabirds that suggest they already know what a fishing vessel is. The fact that when this sub came up and there were a bunch of albatross acting like seagulls, and that's because this area has had a lot of trawlers and longliners. There's a lot of potential for harm uh, due to fishing gear, whether it's free floating or landing on the bottom. So a natural question would be, how sensitive are those communities to that sort of impact? Could they recover quickly? Because it takes a very long time for these corals to grow. And so I think the impact would be pretty serious. We came here because we had seen that the deep sea fauna between Alaska and Hawaii were completely different. And so we hypothesized that there was a boundary. If you look at an overall map of the Emperor Seamount chain, you'll see what we saw in the topography, and that is, as you go from north to south, the different seamounts are a certain distance apart, and then bang, there's a jump. And so we called that the gap. And so north of the gap, one set of species, south of the gap, another set of species. There is a boundary of sorts, and it's going to, I think, wait until we further analyze the specimens that we collected to know how clean the boundary that was, but we definitely saw a boundary. The real work is going to start once we get back to our home institutions and we start analyzing all of our individual samples. And once that data for species IDs has come around, we can then start working on that broader biogeography question of what is where. If the deep sea is all one big unit, then you know you could put a few protected areas wherever it was convenient and that would take care of it. But if the deep sea is in fact divided up, into a bunch of biogeographic units, then it's important to have protected areas in each one. 